Today's honored guest is Michael Vasquez from No Sound Bouts Allowed. Michael, thank you for being here today. Oh, I'm happy to be here, and thank you for inviting me. It's always great to have conversations with my fellow Marines. Yes, there we go. Uh, you know, Michael, you're a veteran. Please tell us a little bit about your background. Well, uh, there's a lot to it. I'm a little bit older than what some people might think. Uh, I'm actually 56 now. I wouldn't have told. I wouldn't. I wouldn't guess that. Uh, it's when I keep the hair low, so you don't see all the gray. But so I, I'm I'm old school in the Marine Corps, and my dad was a Marine before me. Served in Vietnam, came out with 100% um, disability. He suffered from Agent Orange and PTSD. Uh, something that's very common with a lot of people back in that time, and even now with a lot of our guys coming back home from overseas. So I have a soft spot in my heart for that. I understand what it is to grow up with that in the family. Uh, I'm a kid from the Bronx, grew up, you know, middle class poor, actually just poor, <laughs> and went to Evander, High, uh, Evander Childs High School in the Bronx. People may not be familiar with it, doesn't exist anymore. Crazy, but uh, went there, went to school at Rutgers University and joined the Marines. And uh, it was great, working with communications, 29 Palms, the Stumps sucks. Um, and I'm sure everybody who's been <laughs> at the Stumps <laughs> knows it, it sucks. Uh, and from there, after I got out, uh, I actually went over to Moscow. I've lived in Moscow, Tbilisi, Riga, uh, I do speak Nogaparuski, such as Um And anyone who knows Russian knows, yeah, I speak bad. Although I have a Moscow accent, believe it or not, and I learned that all by ear. Came back to the U.S., uh, I'm condensing like a couple decades here. Uh, came back to the U.S., went over to California, tried to open up a movie studio, got one wire transfer away from being able to own Valencia Studios. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. It was, did a bit. Went through the Northridge earthquake, broke my leg in a couple of places, uh, got a rod and pins in there now. Came back to New York uh, with family, became a stockbroker, did that for about, what was it, nine years, I think it was. Uh, never had a lawsuit, never had a complaint, which was fantastic. Not a lot of brokers could say that. That brings me to about 2000 saw the market crash. We had the Twin Towers. I was working in the Chrysler building that day, and I was terrified. Lost a few people in the Twin Towers, uh, traders that I knew. And from there, saw the market going negative, saw the regulation coming in. It was becoming more litigious and not as lucrative. So I said, okay, you know, I'm going to go off and work with a buddy of mine, start a investor relations company, trying to get this is about 2001, 2002, and trying to get into that realm because everyone was starting to get into the digital wave. That was when everyone started saying, what are web blogs? You know, these blogs. Yeah, uh, started doing that and developed about 150 of them with my partner, uh, trying different avenues as well as doing the investor relations, which then led to me doing No Sound Bites Allowed a couple of different forms early on. But I found my niche, which is talking about politics uh, from a conservative Republican point of view, which a lot of people look at me and they go, oh my God, you're evil here. Mm -hmm. you, you know you're black, right? You know, you know you're a black Hispanic, right? And like every day when I look in the mirror, yeah, I, I got that. But my politics naturally flowed to that. And that's partially from being raised in my family, partially because of the experiences both here in the United States on both coasts and a couple of other places I lived, as well as living overseas and living in Moscow and actually seeing communism and socialism up front in person, being, I was there in 91 during the coup. When they, when the Adaf Geset tried to get in, take, took uh, Yeltsin, put him into, uh, well, it was actually Gorbachev. They had Gorbachev at a dacha, a little house, and they held him down, they were, trying to get Yeltsin to lock him up. We had tanks rolling down the main street, Kutuzovsky, and everyone, every American, every foreigner I knew were trying to figure out, 
okay, how do we get to an embassy, which embassy, which flight to get out of the country? It was a crazy time. So, yeah, I, I am very I conservative see, I, Republican. Yeah, I can understand your point of view. Now, for the veterans and the individuals watching, this is a prime example of what the military, I assume, can Always. give you some ability to educate you and and give you that well-roundedness to put you in, in those type of positions and those... Uh, and, and to be so lively as well. Well, I, I love it. Now, I started off, my dad, Marine, structured, and he had his problems with the PTSD, um, and that wound up being one of the things that killed him. Uh, Agent Orange killed him. My condolences. Uh, and that was in 2001. Mm. Um, but it was, he also had a crazy kind of life before. He volunteered for Vietnam. Um, and I was just born when he went. And uh, that's because he loved America. Puerto Rican from mainland Puerto Rico. And he came over, met my mom. Um, and when the war started up, he volunteered said, no, I love this country. It gives him so many opportunities. And in my experience, in my life, I have seen, you know, the racism of the 70s. People talk, oh, America's so racist. Today, I'm old enough I remember what racism was. And I, in my generation, we went from there'll never be a black president, maybe in my grandkids' generation, mm -hmm. to being alive during Obama. Mm -hmm. um, horrible president, but a president broke that glass ceiling, said, yeah, we can. It, it's, you can't see that kind of transition in any other country. No other country has as much diversity and wealth of people and opportunity as America. All of everything that's in the world is here in America, and a lot of it is in New York, of course, but no other country can say that and do it peacefully. And that's really amazing. So that's a wonderful benefit. Now, I bring that up because in my family, we knew people from um, in the apartment building my family has lived in for the last 50 years. We had people from Eastern Europe that came to America because they were trying to escape World War II and the Nazis. Uh, we had people, a, a German family, who actually had the American Foreign Legion. Just because my mom uh, was trying to raise me and my brothers and sisters, said, okay, uh, you want to go to camp this year? Go to the American Legion camp. Oh, wow. It's like, oh, wow, sure. And my mom said yes, and it was great. Went there a couple of times just because he was there and he said, you know what, you're a young kid, you're a young man, you could do that. Uh, a very good family friend came from Hungary and Lester was a great inspiration to me. Also a very strong figure, he uh, came over to get out of World War II and he helped to teach me a lot of how to work with wood and how to do handiwork. You put all these experiences together and then when I'm 18, and I've been wearing suits since I was in like ninth grade. So I'm a little bit odd, maybe. And I'm, I remember I was walking through the school library and there was a Marine recruiter. He's in the library. And I was thinking about it. I said, you know what? Well, let me walk up to him. I walk up to him and go, and most arrogant thing I've probably ever said, what can you do for me? Because I know what I can do for you. Mm. <laughs> arrogant as they come. <laughs> Uh, but it was great. The experience with the Marine Corps, one, introduced me to a lot of people. At that time in my life, I hadn't gone anywhere. I was a New York kid. And I got to meet people from around the country, a couple of people who had never been in person with black people before, so that was a new experience for them. We hashed that out a couple of times uh, and wound up to be very good friends. Uh, l learning about their differences, my differences, the fact that we didn't know about each other, and we learned, and we were unified by the Marine Corps. We were Marines. We were side by side, so we worked through our issues. Uh, discipline, the ability to know, yes, I can do this. I can survive these crazy situations, and it came through the skills I learned in the Marine Corps in terms of personal discipline, in personal perseverance and being calm in a hectic situation. Well, when I was in Moscow and we had the coup, everyone's losing their minds. 
I said, okay, first thing, we need to establish communications. Can we make phone calls back to the United States? Well, it took, and it took pretty much the entire morning, most of an afternoon of nothing but calling to finally get a phone call that did connect. And we were able to finally get messages out to people here in the United States from there, I think it was one of the few phone calls that were actually connected internationally. It only took us like five hours to actually get it done, six oh. hours. Um, but that was because I was focused. I was calm, I had a mission, I had a goal. I contacted all the embassies. I contacted many of the expatriates that I knew trying to figure out, okay, what's our plan? Do we have an exit strategy? Can we get to this embassy, that embassy? If you can't get to this one, then here's another one that's aligned with your nation. We can get to there. Uh, make sure you have your passport. Have a uh, go-ready bag. That we, If I call you, I say, we're going. Pick up the bag and meet me. We're not wasting time. And here's where I'm going to meet you at. And here, this is the path we're going to take. Um, and here's an alternate route just in case, you know, we're suddenly blocked. This is the other way we're going to go. It was a very interesting time. And because the Marine Corps trained me so well to think under pressure, to not just be emotional, but to have to create a mission, to know that you can achieve that mission, is very important. And that's happened a couple times in my life. When I was in the Northridge earthquake in California, um, again, slow down, think it through. Uh, is everyone safe? Check out their neighborhood. Let's go through and see, you know, do I need to be prepared for first aid? What supplies do we have? What supplies do we need? How can we get them? Can I organize everyone in the community and work with them to go, okay, we're going to take an hour, hour and a half trip outside the, out of, uh, we were in the uh, West Falls region, take an hour and a half trip over to Apple Valley to be able to buy meat. And okay, what are we gonna buy? Hamburgers and hot dogs. Yeah, well, Simplest course. thing yeah. feeds everyone and a bunch of you know buns so we can feed everyone, including the kids. Bring it back, everyone pulls out their uh, grills. We're grilling for, uh, divide the meat to everyone and everyone's grilling and anyone wants to eat in the neighborhood, they can walk up to any grill and they eat the food. This way everyone's taken care of. It's these, it's these experiences that the average person hopefully will never have to go through, but because the Marine Corps did its job in preparing me and, and giving me a discipline both in body and mind, that when a lot of the adversities I've gone through, I now have a different approach. That switch kind of just clicks back in, and now I'm in that mode of, okay, this is how we get through that. Now, you're a unique person that I can speak to regarding, you know, because it's not only a veteran in politics and, you know, your experiences that you had going in and, and et cetera. Um, would you push towards the youth to go in, into the military, knowing that the current political climate that we have? Uh, I tend to approach when people say, well, what do you think of the military? Should I go or should I not? I've had a couple of kids, younger people who've said that to me. And, and I answer them kind of like how I answer people who say, well, I want to know about politics. Okay, do you want my opinion or do you want me to give you the facts? There's two different aspects. They're not the same thing. My opinion's obviously going to color those facts, how I felt about it, what I thought, what I took out of it. Um, the facts are, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go to boot camp. You're going to go over to Paris Island and they're going to bust you. They're going to break you and then they're going to rebuild you. You will not be the same person that comes out of boot camp that goes into boot camp. That's assuming you pass. It's very difficult. I'm speaking specifically, of course, about the Marines. Army, Navy, they all have similar but more easy pastimes. And, of course, there's the Air Force. Cakewalk, um, mind you, love you guys, but it ain't the same. Um, but uh, so there's that. You know, these are some of the facts of what you're going to deal with. And yeah, you're in the if you're going into the Marine Corps, yeah, you're going to combat. You know, nine out of ten, you're going to be in a hostile hot zone. Someone's going to be firing at you. You will probably be firing back. Can you live with that concept? Do you understand that you know this is reality? It's not a movie. So those are facts. Well, experiences. 
made some met some great people. You know, everywhere that I go that I meet other Marines, these are great people. We have a commonality. And I can trust them. I have I truly believe that every Marine I meet, I have an inherent trust of them and their opinion that I start with. Now, actions and situations may change that, but I start with, okay, that's my safe point. That's someone I can always rely on. Why? I know what they went through. They know what I went through. No matter what other experiences we went through, we have a commonality. There's something I can talk to that person about that I can get down to the nitty gritty and know we can be straight, we can be direct, and nine out of ten times, I'm absolutely sure that, you know, some, you know, stuff hits the fan, I know, okay, this person at that moment, they will be able to click just like I will, we can make it through this, we can survive. That's a great experience to have throughout the rest of your life. It's a comfort, even though it's subconscious, is in the back of your mind, that's a comfort that you have in all the different adversity you might go through, and I hope no one ever does, but you might. And so that's the answer I give them. So, okay, and now you want to get into more details, like what happened at this base, or what happened at that base, or you know, my guys yeah. who went overseas. Everybody's but, different. He's going to have a different experience, and so on. Right, like and, and then we can get into that. But that's the thing I start with, and say, okay, if these things make sense to you, then yeah, you volunteer. If they don't make sense to you, why are you going to do that to yourself? You're going to be miserable. Well, I mean, you know, you shared your, your experience of joining. You know, for me, I wish I had something more patriotic, but, uh, you know, I, I was finishing wrestling uh, practice, and I was just walking by and sort of recruiter, and I was like, um, you know, how you doing? You want to join? Sure. That's it. <laughs> a simple conversation. And, you know, they the tried to, you loved know, you. He loved me. He's trying to do the, the whole sales pitch, like, we'll get you uh, money, education. I'm like, look, look, I'm good. Just, I'm good. I, can, I was on the wrestling team, um, you know, above average, you know, intelligence and all this stuff. And, you know, Did they golden. get you for machine gun or tanks? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. But, um, you know, for, you know, everybody's situation is going to be different. You know, I'm glad you had it. You know, it sounds like you had a great experience. Mm -hmm. Me, you know, I, I enjoyed my time. You know, people always say, you know, you, you seem not to um, be enthusiastic, but I'm like, I've dedicated my whole life, adult life, for my country. And leaving the military, I've dedicated um, helping out the veterans in the community with Vet Talk and, and Devil Dog USA. You know, th that's how I spent basically my time doing it. So I, for me, it's not mentality of that I'm, I need to help. I'm already doing it, so it's not, it's not like I have to live that oorah life and, you know, pins oh, yeah. and, you know, for me, it's just, I, I'm here. I, I never left, you know, t you know in, in a sort of a way. Well, I tend to notice that a lot of us who've served tend to do things, whether it's big or small, but a lot of us are involved, whether it's in politics, in school boards, in, um, you know, the, the school teams, you know, kids' teams or something. And all of that matters. It's all about, okay, we continue to serve in big and little ways. Not everybody, but even the little things that we do uh, are examples and expressions of our love of our country and all of the rights and privileges and everything that we, that we stood for, that we were willing to bleed, and many of us have bled for. So I'm not surprised that, you know, the work you've done with Devil Dogs, uh, the work that you're doing in terms of politics, just in community, you're a chaplain. I mean, I can't compare, I don't, com it's never a competition, but it's always something that I find is, is, I kind of expect it to a certain extent. I'm not surprised, let me say it that way. You can see a Marine walking by, you know, you're. Yeah, that, that guy's a Marine. Yeah, I see that. You know? There's an element to yeah. it. And, and it's not like, oh, I'm not a bodybuilder. We don't have to be, you know, Mr. Universe all the time. I know we all felt like that when we got out of boot camp. But, you know, no, we grow. We get older. But it's still that core is in there. And you can see it. Yeah. So now let's circle back a little bit to uh, your, your talk show, mm -hmm. uh, No Holds Bar. No, no sound, sound bites, bites allowed. allowed. Mm -hmm. Now you've been doing it in, in different forms in over the years, eighteen mm -hmm. years now. Um, 
I mean, the way you you're approaching everything, politics, your life, your everything in the military, there's always something that we bring into our our work and our business. How has um, your show been incorporated to to all those things? I know it's more political. Oh, it's very political. Uh -huh. uh, I, I'm a political commentator. I don't like to say journalist because many journalists are caught into that corporate system where they don't get to actually express all the stories. They don't get to go into all the details. They're, you know, you work for the New York Times. You have a frame of reference you're going to be pushed to put out there. There are certain mm -hmm. stories they're not going to talk about. Kind of like what we just learned about President Biden. Uh, how long has he been working only six hours a day? And who's in charge for the 18 hours a day? He isn't capable of running the country. Oh, well, the first one is they don't want to talk about it. The second one is don't ask that question. That's why I do political commentary. Um, but that political commentary, because I'm independent, it allows me to do a lot of things that the mainstream can't. I have conversations with, with first-time candidates or... Um, candidates that are, aren't in the two major parties, you know, third party candidates, whether libertarians, conservatives, uh, progressives even, uh, I have conversations with them so people know the choices that they have. I can talk about the issues that the mainstream doesn't want to go into. Like, okay, who's in charge for 18 hours a day? I want to have that answer. And I can focus on issues that I think are important, like maintaining we just had someone try and assassinate President Trump, former President Trump. Well, now you look at the news media and they're trying to turn that into, when they were talking to uh, former Secretary of the Secret Service, uh, Cheadle, Kimberly Cheadle, they try to say, well, it's about the gun. You heard all, over and over again from Democrats, they were saying, well, it's about the gun. Say, he had an AR-15, he had an AR-15 style firearm. That was never the problem. There are over 700 and, if I, if I remember the last uh, AF, um, AFT, ATF, excuse me, the uh, last ATF records that I saw, which were from 2022, there are over 745,000 machine guns in America. There have only been four times that machine guns have been used in a crime since 1932. Oh, but... AR-15s and, and, and semi-automatic rifles, they're just dangerous. No, they're not. It's the person. The person's dangerous. And whether they're using a homemade improvised uh, uh, IED or whether they're using a semi-automatic rifle or a handgun, they're the danger. They will find a way. There was that one guy in uh, Wakusha who used a car. It's not the weapon. It's the person. That's the danger. Um, and we can talk about those things. And I can talk about also, I'm a very much uh, an advocate of homelessness. I've been homeless twice in my life. And I'm a strong advocate for people who have been homeless, and especially vets who have been homeless, to try and find ways to help them whenever I can. So that's all the things that are inside of what I'm trying to do as an independent and political commentator. It, it, it sounds like it's, well, I guess it is kind of a lot. <laughs> well, I mean, it, and it is a lot. And the direction that you've taken everything is, is um, different than the mainstream. That is, you know, we'll get, out the, we'll get that out there. But at the same time, you're giving people the voice that others won't give. You know, I, I've, you know I've been on your show. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and somebody like me who is more of a, uh, a moderate, even though I have different positions in politics, uh, everybody was always surprised. Well, we assumed you'd be this way or, or that way. If it wasn't for the fact that, like, let's see, somebody like you giving me that voice out there, I, I wouldn't be, you know, my work in journalism, my uh, in media, and my work as a nonprofit leader puts me in the spotlight. When it comes to politics, though, it, it's, it's dimmer. A whole other A world. lot dimmer, yeah. you know? Uh, I remember, you know, in the past, you know, it's open for the public that I've been in running for office. Last year, I got no media um, for my politics, um, except for the be well in the beginning. And you know, the they, announcement they do it. Uh, you announced, announced. It. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, because they're you know, somebody's actually doing something against you know an incumbent, but then it dims out. But once again, because of my 
other stuff, I'm, I'm in the limelight. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be so well known in my community. I know exactly how it is. In 2014, I ran for Congress. In 2020, I ran for um, legislator, county legislator in upstate New York, Binghamton, New York. So I, I have been through that experience. I know what it is to run, especially in a congressional race. It is very difficult. People don't realize how hard it is, but it's important, even if you don't per se win, um, just by highlighting the issues that need to be addressed Everyone, it may not seem like it, but the incumbents, the various parties, they're paying attention to that and saying, oh, people are talking about this. They want to run for this. This is important. We need to focus a little more. We have to pass something dealing with this. We have to address this issue. Otherwise, the next time, they're coming back at us mm -hmm. and they'll have even more people behind them. So it's always important to be able to run, and I, I recognize that. Um, it, it's just interesting. Okay. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. for the audience that may not uh, be able to, that, that don't, don't, the work that you're doing, let them know how they can reach you, how they can contribute, oh God, where they can find you. It goes you. so fast. So uh, if you want, you can just type in no sound bites. That's one word with an I allowed. That's it. No sound bites allowed. I can tell you that I've been in Paris and I know you can find me there. I've been all across America. I know you can find me with that. Even as Google and the rest of them try to suppress it, you will find me. And I've covered just about any issue that's important to you. So why not check it out? For those interested in joining us at Vet Talk, you can email us at CEO at DoubleDogUSAInc.org. And as always, God bless America. God bless you all. Why do 70% of critical thinkers ditch Disney Plus? Because they found something better. In today's economy, every dollar counts. So what's worth subscribing to? Let's compare Disney Plus and no sound bites allowed. With Disney Plus, you're shelling out $140 a year for virtue signaling shows targeting mythical modern audiences. Plus, a theater visit could cost you 40 bucks or more. Ouch. Now imagine a platform where fresh perspectives, insightful interviews, and engaging discussions are at your fingertips. That's no sound bites allowed. And the best part? It's free with an option to support only if you choose. While Disney Plus ticks off virtue signal checkboxes, no sound bites allowed offers real talk and sharp analysis. Perfect for those who crave depth and clarity. Why break the bank for entertainment? Subscribe to No Sound Bites Allowed and enjoy meaningful content without the hefty price tag.